Okay, so what was it like being a woman studying law back then? There were many women studying law at the time that I went into Kayfield to do law. At that time, I think women were already moving up and thinking that the women's, a woman's place is not just in the home. Also, of course, many women are seeking independence. And so you find that there were many women studying law in my class where I was there, you know. So it wasn't like a male thing, you know. I think it was very much mixed. I'm curious to know what inspired you to pursue law. As when I taught before I did law, I, I went to university to pursue a degree in, which majored in English before I did law. And I had a brother who was a lawyer. I had two brothers who were lawyers, but one in particular, Fitzroy Bryant, who you probably heard about. He kept saying, you got to go do law, you got to do law. And so he really was the one who was sort of pushing me to go and do law. And in the end, I just decided, okay, I'm going to go. So it was mainly like, you know, he wanted me to do law. Not that I was opposed to doing law, but I think it is his push it really got me thinking maybe I should really go and pursue law, so I did. So did you have another career in mind other than being a lawyer if Mr. Bryant didn't push you towards that career? I don't think so. So that's what I'm saying. I think I didn't have that big ambition to be a lawyer. Okay. I was quite comfortable being a teacher actually, but he's the one who said, you know, you need to go and do law. We have a whole firm here and so on, you need to go and do law. So in the end, I, I did. Your teaching career, Your Excellency, spanned about 18 years. During that time, were there any notable students that you taught? There's so many that I don't even know where to begin. Because <laughs> I taught at the Passe High School, and then I went to the Cairn High School. So I taught at both those high schools for a number of years. And I taught, oh my, right now, so many of them would come to me and say, you remember when you taught me in Bassey High School or when you taught me in Keon High School? There are so many of them that I taught. Um, if I just think off the top of my head to see if I could remember <laughs> so many of these people that I taught. Um, there's a gentleman who just recently retired. He was in charge of prisons. James, I taught him. I know him as Trumper, as you know. <laughs> but I taught him, for example, you know. I taught um, Dr. Cameron Wilkinson in, in sixth form, though. I, I, I taught sixth form at the time, and he was one of the persons in, in that class. I remember I, I taught um, Anthony Johnson, blessed memory. He too was one of those people in that sixth form um, that time when I taught um, general papers, was called GP at that time. So I could span, I could span nearly all the professions here now, right? But I'm really very proud of the students generally to see where they are today. Um, I'm generally very proud of them. I went to school too late. <laughs> <laughs> so other than what you would have mentioned, do you have any other highlights in your teaching career before we move on? Um, no, I think I just enjoyed the interaction with the students and being able to help them was really my satisfaction at the end of the day, especially those who are struggling. Because normally people always talk about who bite and who this and so. I always say those people who allegedly bite will pass. They don't even need you. Some of them, right? But it's these who have issues and who, when you get those to write the exam and pass, then you know you're doing something. And that was really my satisfaction. You would have been a great mentor for me in the classroom. 
again, we came here too late. <laughs> All right. Uh, I want to focus now, uh, Your Excellency, on your time as an attorney. Uh, let's talk about your admission to, uh, well, your admission uh, as a barrister and solicitor for the Eastern uh, Caribbean Supreme Court in 1994. What were some of those highlights? If I recall, the day that I was admitted, um, it was a little bit nervous, a little bit, because all of the training and so on that you have is mainly books, you know, that you read and you write exams and so on. And then you go to law school, I went to Norman Manley in Jamaica, and you get some practice, you go to court and see how the lawyers function and so on. But then when you have to do it yourself, that's a completely different thing. And so it was a little bit at first, but like everything else, after a while you get the hang of it. And then because I had my brothers in the office, that also helped tremendously. Because they'd be there to encourage you, they'd be there to support you, they'd be there to point out certain things to you. So that helped a lot, you know. So it was a journey, one that I enjoyed. So I'll encourage any young person who wants to pursue the law that they should, because it is very useful, even if you don't end up being a lawyer. Uh, but I have so many lawyers in my family now because my son is now a lawyer. <laughs> and I, I, I didn't tell him to be a lawyer. When he was going to CFBC here, I actually told him to do law, and he said, no. I'm not going to do any law because you just want me to do law because you're a lawyer. And I said, no, I want to do what you want. So he didn't do law up at CFBC. No, and he went off to the States and did a degree in finance. And I thought, great, you know? And then he started to work, you know, here and there. And then he said, I think, mommy, I think I'm going to do law. I said, really? He said, yes. So I just encouraged him. Yeah, he's now found a job at a very good firm in New York, and you know, I'm just encouraging him all the way. Then I have a nephew who came here, and he also did law. Yeah, so he lives in Germany, um, but he works for a very prestigious law firm in Germany. You know, so I met it in the blood, maybe. I think it does. <laughs> <laughs> Most lawyers and doctors I find get into um, politics. What, why did you get into politics? Hmm. So good question. For one thing, I would tell you that it was not one of my ambitions to be going to run for office, put it this way. It was certainly not one of my ambitions. But if you know my family, my family was always involved in politics, always. So I grew up in it, right? And so I tell people all the time that the biggest politician I know was my mother, right? Um, I don't know, you might know her, but she used to write a board, a blackboard that's attached to Massey's house. Right? A board is still there, but nobody writes it now. But every day, she leave home with a paper, and she, before she go with the paper, she write, now whatever she gonna say, she say, may I have to check this for me? She checking for the English, right? Check this for me, so I'll check it. And she would have she chart and she would write the board, right? Every day. It became a tourist site. Tourists would stop, take pictures of the board, take pictures of her writing the board, write what she did. And I remember distinctly, at that time, ECCB, what is now ECCB, was ECHO. And Eastern Caribbean Central Authority changed to bank now. And their offices were directly opposite Massey's house. You know, that building on the exact opposite side of Massey's house. And one day, I met the then governor, which was Sir Dwight Venner. And he called me and he said, that lady is your mom? And I said, yes. He said, she comes every day and write the board. And he said, whenever I have my coffee break, I go by the window to read what's the latest on the board, right? And I say, I say you know what I call her? I say, what? He said, the leader of the opposition. <laughs> you mentioned your mother 
And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I actually had the pleasure of meeting your mother and interacting with her quite a few times. And I was... I, I, I could actually... <laughs> I could paint the picture for you because... <laughs> She was, she was all, you know, a, a bundle of life from what I remember, and I probably wasn't any more than 10 years old at the time, uh, you know, when she passed, but I do remember those interactions and cherish them a lot. I could actually paint the picture for you of her store and the layout that she had. You know where that is. It's pretty close to where the office is and so on. So when you talk about her, uh, there's an image that I have, and I guess I can personify some of those traits if I look at her, uh, asking you now, what about her? inspired you to lead the life that you had? Everything. She was the most courageous person I know. Nothing daunted her. I when I say courageous, not just in what she does, but what she says. I, I, I never agreed with everything she said, but you can't stop her from saying it. And she said to anybody, the king, the queen, the prime minister, person cleaning the drain, it does not matter. So, and that is how she was. She, she was very friendly, she was very warm, she helped a lot of people, but she was definitely a courageous woman. And she took on the promotion of women, and as we approach international women's, I always remember her, because she, to me, was the pioneer who advocated for women's rights, for women's empowerment. I, I don't know anybody before her who did that. She took on that. She became the president of CARIWA, which is the Caribbean Women's Association. She was the president of Toast Mystery Saints, I guess because she said women have to learn to speak properly. So she, she was in Toast Mistress. She was, the, she was the person who represented a trade union women here in St. Kitts. Any women's organization that you could think about, she was the person who was carrying it right here in St. Kitts. And one of the projects she had that stayed with me, she had a project called Learn to Earn. And she said in her trips around the country, she saw, saw so many women in poverty, impoverished and who had to be depending on men to get a little two cents, that she wanted to make women more financially independent. And so she got this project Learn to Earn, and she got some sponsors from the states, so however she got them to sponsor this project. And so she started these cottage industries. You know what cottage industries are, right? That is just little businesses that they set up in their homes. That's why they call it cottage, yeah, in their homes. And so she got these people to come in to show them how to how to to do hams, how to cure ham, how to make jellies and jams at the time, how how to bake different types of things and so on. And she carried out all these training throughout the country, especially for rural women. And at the end of the day, a lot of them did set up these cottage industries out of their homes and started selling all these things, curing hams for people and so on so that they could make their own income. And I thought that was so impactful. But that was how much she um, felt about women's empowerment. Um, the other thing that stays with me, a lot of things stays with me, of course, about her, which I want to pass on to you and to all young people. When we go into all our battles and so on, regardless of whatever it is and so on and so on, she will always say, do not let anyone define you. That to me was extremely powerful. That has stayed with me throughout the politics, throughout the netball, throughout the everything. Because especially in a very uh, fierce political environment, if you listen to everything people saying about you, <laughs> you know, and so on, you could become very discouraged if you're listening. But my mind was, don't let nobody define you. You have to know who you are. And that's exactly what stayed with me throughout all those times. And I pass it on all the time to people. Because I know if you don't do that, you lose your focus. You lose touch with whatever you want to become. 
because everybody have a different story and have some obstacle to try in your way and have something. But if you know what you want and you stick to that, don't let anybody define you. So I tell you and you and all the others. As I told somebody the other day, I think I did my part. And so I'm not one who like, I move on yeah, all the time. Even with the netball, I, I, I was president and when I was the president, to be honest, if you ask anybody, I had the whole pack rocking. Netball was practically empty before I became the president in terms of support and so on. And I went in there and had all the stands full, sugar bowl in there, music flying by, everything. And the next time the elections came around, I told them I wasn't going back up. And they were like, no, you have to go. I said, no, 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 I'm moving on. I'm not going back up. The good thing is that at that time, the Constitution said that you have a post of past president. So at least I will serve for another year as past president. Of course, you know, weren't happy with that. So, but I did and moved on. So I, I have no problems with moving on. So what was it you did to get the park working out? Boy, that's a very good question. Huh. I'll tell you one thing that I know about life. People, usually they will criticize and say, oh, this ain't happening, that ain't happening. But if you put them to do it, they don't have any ideas, they can't do it, right? But they just know what not happening, right? But if you're going to be in a position and you realize what the issues are, then you have to work hard to address them. And remember, these are voluntary things. And let know everybody think if you move a stone, you have to get paid. Voluntary, so you have to give up your time and everything. And one of the things I noticed why netball sort of went down at the time is that And we went from community to community, right? Find out what's happening with the young girls in this community, why they're not playing netball, especially in the areas where they were actually netball fields. <laughs> Nobody really used it. So we went from community to community throughout the entire island. At the end of the day, we came up with a list of those who were saying, look, we want to go back to play netball. So I then went and set up a set of coaches. And I said, okay, you're coaching Depe, you're coaching Sandy Point, you're coaching Saddlers, you're coaching this. I will send the coaches around the island to help the situation. And of course, you know, you keep monitoring and so on. And so at the end of the day, we were able to get those teams back into play in the, in the tournament. So with the teams came the communities. Because when Sandy Point plays on Sandy Point, people are going to come to the park to support them. And so we were able after a while to just fill up the sand and I got like sugar bowl involved, you know. So at, so at the game itself, you have this kind of like commentary thing which people like and then the music in between and the bar and everything. So in the end, we were just able to fill those stands with people. Nice. But like I say, it's hard work. And nowadays, one, you can't get people to give up the time to do these things. And two, they want to know how much. <laughs> it, it's different now, it seems. But I'm marveling at the fact that you were able to do that, to go and see that need and actually bring community spirit back together so that everybody could appreciate netball. Think about that. So those were the teams who were ahead of us at that time, 1979. Indeed, indeed. So let's talk about your role as minister, right? We know you were the Minister of Health, Social Services, Community Development, Culture, and Gender Affairs. And you were instrumental in drafting several legislation, two of which we will touch on today. That is the, the Domestic Violence Act and the Equal Pay Act. Can you touch a bit on those for us? Well, as Minister of Gender, um, basically, when I think about it now, I really wanted to do two things. I wanted to further empower women, because you know, I still have a long way to go even now. But at the same time, not to isolate men. Because um, I find sometimes that when we say in women and women's empowerment, um, we forget that they are men. And as you know, 
a lot of our young men are uh, falling between the cracks. So it can't be just women empowerment. It has to be women empowerment, but you also have to make sure that the men are looked after. And as I was telling somebody, my mother had six children, five boys, and one girl, right? And so I was looked after by my brothers. As a matter of fact, um, Dr. Kathleen Ferdinand, my friend, she always said to me, when she said, you're the only woman in the cabinet, she said, anyway, you're accustomed to that, you're the woman in your house, right? She said, maybe if you had a bunch of sisters, it might seem strange. And she's right, in the cabinet, I was comfortable because it's like deja vu. It happens in my house, you know? Five men in there and me, you know? So, but back to the Domestic Violence Act. So, part of that empowerment of women had to do with the Domestic Violence Act because we had many situations um, that we know that we really needed an act like that to try and address a lot of the issues that were coming up at that particular point in time. Equal pay, same thing, right? We, we didn't have a very big problem with respect to equal pay, but there was a problem. And so we work out, look, we have to address that problem to make sure that nobody future could think that they could have any discrimination in pay between males and females. On the flip side, as I was saying, um, a lot of men coming to me and saying, man, I ain't looking after women, I just thinking, and saying, what about us? So we were able to also do some legislation that I've mentioned to help the men, and they were very, very happy for that. For example, um, child support. There was a time when the women always get child support regardless, even when the children don't live with them. And I was like, how is that fair? So we had to adjust that legislation to ensure that the men could get child support if the children live with them, just as the women get child support, and they love that. We adjusted that legislation as well. So they, they, they admitted other things with respect to me affecting males. For example, I think there was a legislation where if you interfere with a little girl, you have up to 10 years. You get up to 10 years. If you interfere with a little boy, you get up to two years. And I'm like, why? It's the same thing. And so again, we were able to adjust that legislation so that it was 10 years. Boy or girl, right? So there's lots of things we did inside there. Um, well, I was a minister. That's good to know. Do you miss it? Huh? Do you miss it? If I miss it, um, at one point, you know, because I always think for me, politics is the only avenue where you have access to resources that you can help people, right? Um, and so um, that was it for me. Um, if you have access to resources that you can help people, especially those who are most vulnerable, then why not? So it is from that angle, you know, when no, you could only help so much, when you could have helped so much, if you think, uh, only from that angle. But after a while, as I told somebody the other day, I think I did my part. And so I'm not one who, like, I move on. Yeah, all the time, even with the netball. Wealth of knowledge. I think we need to make this a regular thing, Your Excellency, although I know that you're quite busy. But this is amazing. All right, so you talked about netball. I want to speak a little bit now with you about women in leadership in general. And I want to get your perspective, as it were, as to, and something you alluded to before, as to how much further do you think we have to go? We've made progress, obviously. You spoke about your experiences in Cave Hill when you saw that you know, there were quite a few women there. We're in 2023. What are your observations? Um, I think right now they're doing the right thing in terms of putting women in leadership positions because that has been one of the biggest issues. Um, we, in education, um, as you know, a lot of women qualifying, masters, doctorates, this, all sort of things. I don't think there's an issue there. And they're leaders in their own right. But when it comes to leadership in private and the public sector, you go on, you still see 
that there's really a scarcity there. And you have to ask yourself why, because if it is that they have all these doctorates, masters, this and that, how is it that there's still so few women in the boardrooms, in the parliament, right, which is really the top level leadership? I had a view at one point that leadership should be taught in these schools, right, especially leadership, women's leadership, because men things leadership to me, it comes almost natural because people, that's people's perception. When I was running for office at one point, people said, well, you want to be a leader, a little man is who do this, right? So people have that. And you see it in the church. I mean, women can preach in some of the churches. I mean, that's the tradition. I'm not knocking it. But um, that's really, I think, we are, I think here in St. Kitts and Nevis, we are beginning to see, you know, um, that we see, you know, we have the most women in our parliament right now, right? You know, you have the, the speaker currently, the deputy speaker, the clerk of the house, all women now. And then you have three women in parliament, most women ever in parliament, right? So, I mean, in the cabinet, three women. So, I think that the leadership side of it is one of the things that we need to look at. And I remember um, I went to speak on behalf of someone who was being called to the bar, a, a, a woman. I think it's Omelin Sebastian, but I'm not sure. But I went to speak on behalf of one of them, and I kept saying, you know, like, women this and women that. And they just said, it's like, what are you speaking about? Don't you see they have more women lawyers now than, than think more women this and he was like, you know? I didn't get a chance to answer it, right? <laughs> <laughs> what would you have said to him then? Just what I'm telling you. Okay. Right? Just what I'm saying to you. Yes, I, I agree. I mean, we've done a lot in terms of educating women and so on. Mark you, some of it we have to take responsibility for. Because I know I've approached a lot of women to run for office, for example, and I'm going to shy away from it. I am not kind of saying that they shouldn't shy away because it's very difficult. Very difficult for women, but you have to start someplace, right? And so I encourage as many women as possible, you know? I mean, if you look at the Prime Minister of, she says she's, she's retiring now, I think it's, it's either New Zealand or one of them. She has a female. After five years, she's retiring. And people saying, yeah, and I mean, it's the whole pressure on her as a woman. Men don't retire. You know that? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> don't get much pressure. <laughs> but, you know, that's how it is. <sighs> I'm finding my way. But, uh, Finally enough, I'm not really daunted. I thought I would have been. Yeah. And when I stop to think about this, I say, why is it you're not daunted? Um, I think it's because of the number of positions and roles that have played. It's not new in some areas. For example, courtesy calls. I had courtesy calls when I was a minister. So I, I understand now it was kind of new to me when I became the minister. Courtesy calls, you know, all you have to do one thing. But I did that. And so now people pay courtesy calls at me. It's the same thing, really. So it is not reinventing that wheel. You know, no. Somebody's paying a courtesy call, you what you need to do what you need to say, and what you need to... So a, a, a lot of it is um, something that I have experienced before, right? Um, the other thing is that, and that's one of the projects I have actually, maybe you guys can help me with it. I've noticed, not just now, people generally, right, 
in St. Kitts and Nevis, I guess other countries as well, they don't really know what the role of the Governor General is. They don't know. When I listen to them, I'm like, really? By and large, as you know, a lot of things, people come to these conclusions by perception. Whatever people perceive, that's what they believe. But sometimes the perception and the reality are not one. So you might perceive something, but it's not really so. But you believe it because that's what you perceive. And when I listen to people, generally from long time, they think, oh, the government is just the queen's representative here. Well, now the king, right? So you really have anything to do. You're just here representing the queen, you know? And people have that false view. Yes, you represent the king, but you have lots of other things to do, right? And so I'm now embarking on a project to try to educate the public, especially the children, as to what really is the role of the Governor General, quite apart from being the king or the queen, well, in this case, the king representative. And so the other reason why I'm not down to this is because I have to be in accordance with the Constitution, which is a document um, that I'm familiar with. Being a lawyer as well, you would have had to in a way, study the Constitution. So again, that was not new to me. What I have to do is to make myself um, very familiar with the parts of it that says, what is the role of the Governor General? So that I know what I can do and what I can't do. Because the two things I have to do, and which I'm committed to, is to abide by the Constitution, what it says the Governor General has to do, and to abide by the two oaths that I took when I um, became the Governor General.